So, so to, I did think about entitling today's sermon, uh, A Zombie and a Beer. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great on the marquee? I mean, we're kind of packed in here. We could have really filled this place up. Um, that's B-I-E-R, okay? Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the lesson today is, is uh, about Jesus restores life. And, um, and, uh, and like last week when we're taking a look at, at these stories, it's, it's good to have the, the context of what's going on. And, and so for last week's story, we, we looked at the fact that Jesus had really upset the religious establishment. Uh, he, he, uh, he went into the, the synagogue, and although they liked the reading, uh, when he reminded them that uh, during the times of Elijah, uh, there were a lot of widows, but God only helped one, and she happened to be a Gentile, right? Uh, during the time of Elisha, there were a lot of people with leprosy, but God only helped one. He happened to be a Gentile, right? They didn't like that very much, and that was the beginning of, of sort of a, a lot of friction that Jesus was having. So that's, that's sort of the context uh, as we go into Luke chapter 7. Um, and then our story today has, as a context, it has last week's story. And uh, so here's two healing stories, and, and it's good to understand that uh, sometimes these stories are, are placed back to back or right next to each other for a reason. Um, you know, John tells us uh, that, these, that in writing, he didn't write everything down, right? If, if I wrote everything down, the whole world couldn't ha- uh, hold the books that could be written about what Jesus did. But these are written, why? Yeah, so that you might believe, right? That Jesus is the, the Son of the living God and, and by believing have eternal life. So I didn't write everything, but I chose certain things to write, and I, I put them here so you'll believe. And in John, uh, it's easy to see, uh, the, like, two stories set next to each other really plays this out is, is uh, Nicodemus and the woman at the well. Have you ever noticed this? Uh, contrast those two, right? Nicodemus has all the power, right? He's a man in a man's world. He's a religious teacher. He's a top dog among all the religious Guys, he's in the Sanhedrin, he's ruling, uh, probably has, you know, resources, seems like he's a wealthier guy, um, and, uh, and he's a, a teacher of God's word. He seems to be the guy that's really, really close to God and close to getting it. Then you have the Samaritan woman, middle of nowhere, kind of an outcast in her own culture, five-time divorcee, Right? And uh, being taught sort of some, some, some doctrine that doesn't include Jerusalem, which isn't right. So she's way out there. And between the two of them, which one gets it? Not the one you'd think. <laughs> it's not Nicodemus. It's this woman. These stories are placed together for a reason. You see? So the same thing in Luke. As we look at these two stories, uh, there are some contrasts. Um, last week, we had a, 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 a Gentile. This week, probably a Jewish woman, based on what's going on in the story. Um, probably a Jewish woman. So we had a Gentile man. Here we have a Jewish woman. Last week, the guy had, had wealth. We, we knew he had built a synagogue, and he was very kind to the Jews and, and, their, and what they were doing. So, so he was a man of wealth and power. Uh, the woman in our story today, uh, apparently, it looks like she has no means, uh, and her situation is getting worse. Uh, doesn't look like she have, has much power at all either. Last week in the story, uh, Jesus was invited, even begged, to, to be a part of the healing, right? They, they went out to get him, come and heal this guy. This week, they don't even know he's coming, and really when he comes, it's kind of rude. Show up while everybody's crying and say, hey, hey, stop crying. Who says that at a funeral, Right? So he just kind of inserts himself in there. Now, he can do that because he knows what he's about to do. But, you know, in, in the first story, please come. This story, they didn't even invite him. In the first story, uh, Jesus is able to heal this, this man, uh, the servant, without even going to meet him. He doesn't even have to be there. And uh, in our story today, he, he's there present. He touches the beer, B-I-E-R, and he speaks to the man. Uh, and in, the, in last week's story, it's all about faith. Jesus was moved by, he was amazed by the great faith of this centurion 
who, who asked him if he'd come and heal his, his uh, servant and said, look, you don't even have to show up if, if you'll just, you know, kind of do it from over there. <laughs> Great faith. In this one, there's no mention of faith at all. Uh, they don't know he's coming. Nobody knows what he's going to do. And so, so th- there's, there's reasons why these stories are put together. One reason would be, two healing stories, is that you can look through Luke. There's like 22 healing stories. There's no um, systematic, uh, reproducible uh, healing mechanism. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? Like, in, in, in these two stories, he's not there. In this one, he's there. Uh, in a story, he might make you uh, uh, go wash in the pool of Siloam, right? Or he might make mud out of spit and put it on your eyes, right? Or if you're a leper, he might touch you. Or if you're a leper, you might be on your way to show yourself to the priest with leprosy and then be healed on the way, right? There's all these different ways that, uh, that healing happens in the ministry of Jesus, but, but they don't narrow down to some formula. It's not magic words or procedures or incantation or something he does with his hands. Or, it's none of that. All of these healing stories really just focus on who is this guy? Which is the larger question of Luke. He's trying to tell us, he, he, that he's answering the question, who is this guy? Who is this man that can even forgive sins? Who is this man can, that can raise the dead? Who is this guy? That's what Luke is trying to, trying to get across to us. And so, and another thing we see in the contrast is, Jesus is no respecter of persons. Do we get that? How many, of us, how many of us want to be like Jesus? Okay, if you want to be like Jesus, right? This is a big way. Because we live in a world that sometimes people, you know, people like other people who have lots of means. You know, I'll be your friend because of what I might be able to get. Any, anybody know that that exists? Right? I'll be your friend because it, it somehow, you know, I, I'm going to have... You know, you have a lot of money or you, you have a lot of popularity or, or in some way I get to be better because, you know, if, if I know you or, or something, you know how that plays out. But not for Jesus. Yeah, uh, the centurion, he wrote a big check. But that's not why, but Jesus didn't show him any deference or preferential treatment. Uh, this woman doesn't seem to have any means. Jesus, you know, kind of hurries over there and it seems to help this woman. Uh, it doesn't look like she's able to pay him back. There are some ways to be like Jesus here, right? Uh, help those who can't pay you back. Don't give deference to those who have greater means. Um, those seem like in passing, but that's really important stuff. Those are really hard things. But as my wife has been saying recently to my kids, you can do hard things. I like that. Um, but anyway, as we enter the story, that's, that's sort of something we need to hear just by the juxtaposition of these stories. Jesus is not a respecter of persons. Jesus cares about everybody. That's one of the messages of Luke. He came to be a blessing to all nations. Um, So as we go into the story, um, uh, there's that. There's some other contextual stuff will come up, come along in the story. But as we enter the story, we're we're just, we're watching um, as, as this story kind of sets in contrast to the last one. And so we begin in 11. It says, soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. Uh, so there's, there's a textual variant here for the soon afterward. Uh, it also, some versions will say the next day. And that's really interesting to me uh, that, that some people got their, their gospel of Luke and read it. Uh, the next day, he and a large crowd went to Nain. Um, anybody know how far people generally could travel in a day? Yeah, it was about 20 miles was the average traveling time, uh, traveling distance. People would make about 20 miles. Nain is 25 miles from Capernaum. And it's kind of hilly in some places. Uh, anybody would do walking in these hills? <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> um, so, so, in, at least in that text uh, that says the next day, just think about the scene. You've got Jesus and a whole crowd of people hoofing it to get to Nain in a day. 
And why? What for? Uh, except for this incidental story, nothing happens in Nain. I mean, he, he didn't go there for a conference. There, there wasn't some big thing going on in Nain. Why is he going to Nain? And, and even if even if it's just soon afterward, even if it's not the next day on one day they made the trip, I mean, they made the trip and a large crowd. What if they what if they made the trip over two days? Where's everybody sleeping? Who's feeding them, right? It's quite an ordeal here. But either way, why are they going? And and the only thing we know is, well, something happened when he got there. And and so it doesn't look like it was even incidental. It seems like the reason he went, which is amazing. Now, Nain is only five miles from his hometown. I don't know. Maybe he knew this family. I don't know. But I just know Jesus is hoofing it to Nain and a big giant crowd's following him. So get that scene in your head. Um, and, and what we're going to notice, uh, this story looks like it's about the... the uh, I, the, 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 the lesson's called Jesus Restores Life. This story, I didn't go with a zombie and a beer. Uh, but the story uh, looks like it's about the raising of a guy to life, right? And that's not really the story. There is a guy raised to life. There's really three sort of re- restorations to life going on in the story. There's three. And the guy who is dead, his isn't even the, the main point. And we're going to see that. But one of those has to do with this great crowd that's going with Jesus. Why is a great cat crowd from Capernaum, why are they making this 25-mile trek to Nain? Why are they going? All I can think of is they, they seem to be really excited about this Jesus guy. Right? He's been healing multitudes of people, not just the centurion's servant, which was amazing, but, but he's been healing all kinds of people. They were bringing them all to him. And, and so Jesus has amazing, they're, they're energized, they're excited about this Jesus. And, and so here's this crowd just beaming with energy and life, coming this, uh, this 25-mile journey to Nain, following Jesus. As he drew near to the gate of the town. Now, if you're reading this story, if you're in Luke's audience and you're reading this story, there's an illusion here that you would get. It's a slight one, but it's there because Jesus ends up meeting this woman at the gate of this town whose son he will ultimately raise from the dead. Anybody know a story in the Bible like that? Uh, Elisha met the Shunammite woman at the gate of the town and ultimately her son would die and he would raise her from the dead. So there is an illusion here that you would get if you were very familiar with the Jewish stories. Um, Behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So there's the guy who died. But what are these other details? What do we know about this guy who died? He is the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Are those necessary details to a story about Jesus raised somebody from the dead? I mean, Jesus is going to raise this guy from the dead, right? Do we need to have all that detail about his mom for this to be an awesome story? We don't need that. It is important to this story, but if this story was just about, hey, look, Jesus can raise somebody from the dead, how cool is that? If it's just about that, we don't need that that detail. We don't need it. So why is it there? Because there's something about the woman that's important in this story. What does it mean that, she's, that this is her only son and she's a widow? Well, if you understand the economics of that time, this, her social security just died. Her pension, her retirement, her, her welfare, her whatever, it died. Um, most regular families lived uh, daily, making enough money to feed themselves for the day, not having much left over. The, and there's no social program for this widow. So, so when her husband's gone and then her son's gone, how is she going to live? What will she eat? There's nothing left. So, so what's going to happen to me is her plight. And what is going to happen? It's destitution. 
And that's going to mean either prostitution or slavery. That's it. It's all gone. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Isn't that interesting? What's coming with Jesus? A, gi a giant crowd of people is coming with Jesus. And what's their attitude? They're energized. Yay, Jesus. They're full of life. And they're coming with Jesus all like, whoa, hey, yay. God is among us or something, right? Now, this crowd that's coming with her out of the gate, what are, what, what's going on with them? What's their attitude? They're all in mourning with her. They know her situation, and they're helping her grieve as they, as they are in this funeral procession out of town. So just get the scene. You've got this huge crowd of mourners coming out of the town, and you've got this huge crowd of Jesus' disciples and, and all these people energized with life, and there's going to be this huge collision of crowds. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and when the Lord saw her, not the guy on the, on the beer, right? When the Lord saw her, who's this story about? He had compassion on her. Not just in what he did. Oh, that was a compassion act. This word, uh, I mean, try to say that. It's about your guts. And it, it's, he was moved in his guts. In the last story, he was moved in amazement by the faith. In this story, he's moved in his guts about the plight of this woman who's weeping, not just because she's lost her son, but that's it for her. She's destitute. And he's moved with compassion for her. And he said to her, and do not weep here. That, it's not just uh, don't weep, it's, it's stop it. <laughs> right? Now just imagine you show up at a funeral and it's one of those where people are are crying without any hope. See, we have a lot of funerals around here where sometimes we're singing songs of joy, right? Because we're a people with hope and, and we're saying goodbye to people who are going to be with the Lord and, and, and we can praise God for that. But imagine being at a funeral where there's no hope and, and people are, are just crying and it's, it's the worst tears and, and, and somebody comes in and say, ah, stop crying. I know he didn't say it like that, but I mean, how would you hear it? This is not good ministry. They don't teach this in the ministry school, right? <laughs> Although some ministers, you know, uh, maybe say the wrong thing. I, I'm probably guilty of that myself. It's good not to say a lot when you're trying to minister to people in grief, right? Don't say a lot. Especially don't say this. But Jesus can say this because he knows what he's about to do. <laughs> but that doesn't change the shock of the people who hear him and initially say it, right? Just get the scene. I mean, he walks into a funeral and, hey, stop crying. At least for a moment, people are thinking, how rude. Who does this guy think he is? Well, we're going to find out who he is. Don't weep. And then he came and touched the beer. There's the beer. And the bearer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Um. In the last healing, last week, Jesus was on his way to go heal that servant. If he had gone into that Gentile's house, which he was going to do, how would he be viewed by his religious culture? That would make him unclean. He was going to do that. Now, the centurion said, no, you don't have to do that because I, you know, I'm, I'm like you and a servant and you're, you know, I'm not really worthy for you to come to my... I mean, all that, right? So he doesn't do it, but he would have. But he didn't. Here, he touches the beer. Does he have to touch the beer? To heal this young man, does he have to touch the beer? Did, did he touch Lazarus' tomb or something when he did? He doesn't have to. Why? Why does he? When he touches this pallet or coffin that they're leading this guy out on, he's, he's becoming unclean with them in the death of this child. And what kind of Jewish rabbi does this? Who is this guy? But he touches, he touches the beer. And, and in that way, he kind of, he's part of it now. And I think he touches it, uh, it, it for one reason, it causes them to stand still. It, it seems to cause them to stop. 
which is good. They need to stop. And also, I, I think by touching it, uh, it's going to be obvious that it's, it's something that uh, Jesus is doing uh, when this happens, uh, instead of if he's over there somewhere doing it. Um, so he touches it, and they stand still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, that's really weird, in a sense, because this guy's dead. And I remember Pirates of the Caribbean, the guys, I think it's that one, right? Dead men tell no tales. Anybody go on that ride? Is that, am I on the right ride? Okay, well, there should be another guy saying, dead men hear no tales. I mean, right? Can dead people hear? Who's Jesus talking to? This should be encouraging for us uh, for evangelism. Think about it. There are people that we think there's no way that guy's going to hear the gospel. There's no way that that girl wants to hear about Jesus. There's no way that that family wants to know about what God is doing. Because they're just totally against it. Right? In a sense, they're spiritually dead to God and to Jesus. Right? But the word of God is more powerful than that. The word of God can penetrate even to dead ears. This guy's dead, and Jesus is talking to him. That, there's power in that for us. So, so don't, don't shy away from, I'm not saying get in people's faces and, and you know, beat them up with your faith. But if God gives you opportunity and it's right to share at that time, don't not do it because you think they won't listen. Share your faith. Share your story. And so Jesus says, young man, I say to you, arise. And here's the zombie. What does it say? Who? Who? The dead man sat up and began to speak. Okay, I, I don't know if zombies speak, right? They just kind of grunt and stuff. But it does say the dead man sat up, right? Um, anyway, I didn't go with that for a title. <laughs> but... Uh, but the dead man, now go, why does he sit up and begin speaking? What's he saying? Well, we don't know what he's saying, and that's really not the point. What's, what function does it serve for this dead man who sits up to start speaking? You know, there, there's two large crowds, right? And um, everybody knows something right now. Is that right? Everybody knows that something just happened. Jesus spoke to a dead man, and the dead man sat up and began to speak, which means he's alive, right? Not a zombie. He's really alive. And then it says Jesus gave him to his mother. You know what's important about that? If, if you're hearing this story, um, this last sentence is an exact quote in the Greek. If you go back in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, and you read, there is a story in the Old Testament that has these exact Greek words in this sentence. Exactly like this. You know what that story is? Nope. It was the story of a widow whose only son died. And Elijah, it was the widow of Zarephath, and Elijah healed this, this son. And when, and when he healed this son, it says he gave him to his mother. Exact Greek, Greek phrase. So if you're in Luke's audience and you read those words, what does it say to you? Who is this guy? Something special is happening here, right? These people know, they know at least God is with him. They're coming to understand he is God with us, right? And so fear sees them all, and it doesn't mean, oh, no, we're in danger, but awe. Oh, they were like, whoa. And they what? 
glorified God. When we say fear sees them all, who are we talking about? Everybody. The crowd that already was energized by Jesus, but now the other crowd. They're not mourning anymore, are they? No, there's no reason to mourn anymore. And if anyone was upset about uh, Jesus touching the beer like he'd been unclean, uh, he touched, you know, he got close to a dead body or whatever, Jesus could say, well, what dead body? <laughs> right? Anyway, so now the two crowds collided, this event happened, and now the entire crowd is energized about Jesus. It, it, life has been restored in all of them. And they, they began saying, a great prophet, because they understood this is like what happened in our Bibles. This is like the times of Elisha. These are the days of Elijah, is what they were thinking, right? Um, and, and notice what, they, what their testimony was. And God has visited his people. This is, Jesus is revealing himself. And Luke's telling the story in a way that he is revealing who this Jesus is. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah. But he also said, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Right? When we look through this story, oh, it finishes, and this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and surrounding country. These people went out with a story about Jesus. A story that would awaken dead ears. They went out with a story about Jesus. Um, but there are, so there are three kinds of res restorations to life here. There's the crowd, which we saw one, one crowd, you know, energize the other, or, you know, what Jesus did energize them all, right? So the crowd was raised. There's the son who was raised, and that's important. That's pretty awesome. But as the story's told, if you look through it, it's, it keeps saying her. Jesus had compassion on her. Uh, so he said to her. Right? And, he, and, and when he healed his, the son, he, he gave the son to her. Right? And I don't even know, he might, if, he's, if he's a grown son, to give him back to her means, here's your life back. Here's your, here's your retirement back, right? Here's your, your source of life. So, so it's about her. And I, I just want us to get from that. Um, you know, even if we're not seeing physically dead people raised that's, that's okay. I mean, if God wants to do that, he can do that. But that's okay because we're still seeing what happened in this story. We're still seeing what, what this story is about. We're still seeing that happen. God is still raising up people's lives like this woman. He's restoring life. Uh, my family went to um, uh, a, a church service where Amanda was on the worship team at a church she's been going to. Um, and we just, we love to see her up there uh, leading worship with the, the group. And, and, um, but, a, but a woman uh, uh, gave her testimony and, uh, from a CR group, Celebrate Recovery. And she gave her testimony. And I'm going to tell you, as she was telling her story, I didn't like her. She told her story really well and very honestly. And I kind of I thought maybe, maybe Jesus shouldn't, you know, help this one. I mean, I didn't think that, but I wanted to. Because she was a mess. Didn't you think so, Zizi? She heard, you know, after a surgery, she had gotten on the Vicodin, and, uh, and it, it didn't mess with her then, but, but because she had some left, I think, uh, later on she started taking some for this or that. But she got to a point where, oh, oh, I kind of like this. And, and so she got addicted to this stuff, and, and, then, and then she started like going a doctor hopping and getting different prescriptions and getting them filled and trying to go to different places for, and she just started doing this to where she was like taking 60 a day of these things or so. Can you imagine that? And, and, and she, was, she was taking them from other people and even from her mom. Her mom had a back surgery and, and while her mom was uh, gone, she took a prescription that she was going to have filled in a few days or whatever and she got it filled and she took all those. And when her mom came home, she's like, where's these pills? I'm gonna, I need them. And she kept running around. Oh, look over there. I think they're over there. And she said for two days, she sent her hurt mom tracking down these pills. And, and her mom finally found them. 
in the garbage can, empty pill, pill bottles. And, um, but her mom and dad, they were Christians. They're Christians, and they love Jesus. And, and, but she had stolen from her company, her dad's company. I mean, it's horrible. But she told a story. She had wrecked every relationship you could possibly wreck, and they didn't, just didn't know it yet. And then it all came down. They, they, they called her while she was in a bar, and they said, hey, we're outside. We want to talk to you. And it all happened. And, and be, you know, because she was raised uh, from a Christian home, she knew she had just kind of wrecked her life. And so she put her life in the hands of Jesus right there with her parents. And she, she, she you know, they forgave her. They helped her get into a place where she could get some help. You know, the place said to like 35 of them, only two of you are going to make it out of here alive <laughs> or, you know, and, and graduate. A lot of you are going to leave here and relapse. She determined to be one of those two. And, and, and with the 12 steps of Celebrate Recovery, which are all about Jesus and all about the Word of God, with those kind of 12 steps, she, she is, she's, for six years she's been you know, sober from this stuff. She went and got a, a four-year degree in, in, uh, on her way to do uh, counseling for drug addiction and stuff. But she gave this testimony, and, and you could just see that somebody who deserved death Somebody who was wrecking every relationship in life. All of that was healed and restored and brought up from the pit because of Jesus. That's what he does. And and I don't know. I don't know what we're going through in here. Uh, I, I don't know if it's that bad. But whatever it is, this story is... Who is Jesus? He wants to give life. Whatever it is, whatever it is that's dragging you down, whatever it is that makes you the person who's weeping, Jesus comes and says, you don't have to weep. Don't cry. Whatever it is, he can restore life. And he wants you to have that. He wants you to have that today. And so you got to trust him. you got to put down your ego. you got to you got to decide. They say you got to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you just got to say no. Say no to your selfishness. Say no to, you know, uh, the, the demons, whatever it is that, that plagues you. Say yes to Jesus. And, uh, and I hope you'll do that today. Um, we're going to sing this song. Uh, if you'll stand up, pass your cards into the center. Uh, they'll be collected. And, uh, and come and talk to me if you need to as, we, as Ken leads us in this song.